All right, we're beginning a new section of our biblical counseling series. And uh, as you can see from the slide, it's called the language of counseling. Just a couple of words, a couple of words for these, these last few sessions. We have about four, maybe five sessions left. They tend to be more practical and more useful for the, the church at large rather than just for counselors. So you may want to keep that in mind that whether or not you're ever thinking about counseling or, or not, these, are, these topics are important for any interpersonal relationships and especially within the church. So that being said, we'll continue. The language of counseling. And the first topic is, is language and communication. Um, now, we've already studied a little bit about communication in, the, in one or two previous sessions. So some, some of these slides are just going to be a little bit of review. Communication is essential for any, any meaningful relationship. Right? That's, that's basic. I mean, there's no, nothing new there. The next... So the next point on the slides is going to be, what is communication? And we've gone over that. What is the definition, the purest, simplest definition of communication? Who knows the answer? Go ahead. Um, no, I'm not asking what's, what the parts are. Oh. What is the definition of communication? Yeah. Yeah, is a transfer or exchange of information, remember? And then there's three parts to it. You can, now you can, okay. three elements must be necessary for communication. You have the um, sender or the giver message and the receiver and then the Exactly, because if you don't have all three of those elements, then no information can be transferred and, and then communication has not taken place. Uh, uh, I saw that firsthand when I preached down in Columbia, not South Carolina, but Columbia, the state, the, the nation down in South America, and where I had to have uh, a translator because I was speaking in English because I don't speak Spanish, not very much anyway, and uh, I, only, you know, where, where's the food and where's the bathroom? Those are the, that's the extent of my, but useful. <laughs> useful. All right, so communication is, in its purest form, is just a transfer or exchange of information. Language is essential for interpersonal communication. Uh, what do we mean by that? because language can mean the difference between success or failure in counseling. Now again, I'm gonna be using the term counseling, but this is for any interpersonal relationship. If you don't have a language that each person understands uh, in a relationship, it's going to be different. In other words, if I'm saying, and, and I don't necessarily mean you know, from Spanish or English or that, but if, if we're not talking on the same mode, if the words don't mean the same things, you're not going to communicate, all right? And, and that's one of the biggest problems is sometimes we talk over each other or under each other and we're not, we're not really communicating. At the very heart, language is an important gift from God. And John 1.1 1, 1 shows the concept of, of language even in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the, the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you find it interesting that Jesus was referred to as the Word? And we see it throughout Scripture, but there's just one other example in Hebrews 1.3. And he is the radiance of his glory and exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the Word of his power. Jesus is, was probably the most effective communicator that ever, ever lived because he himself was the word of God. 
Now here are five things that we can determine or we can know through language. And, and this is only five, this is, this is just representative. There's many, many more things that we learn. Almost everything we, le we know, we learn through some form of language. But we know that we have the ability to have relationships only through language. Without language, it would be almost, almost Im impossible. Anybody, anybody here a Star Trek fan? Do you remember the one Next Generation where Picard is stranded on a, uh, a, a planet with the head of, an, of another, an alien race? And it turns out they couldn't communicate and they were trying to prevent a war between. And it turns out that the one race, they only spoke in metaphors. And, and Picard couldn't understand because he didn't understand the metaphors. He could understand what he was saying, but he couldn't understand the metaphors. How and was when, the, when the wall fell. Was that the name of it? Uh, no, it was like Game Off or something. Okay. Anyway, if you want to study little interesting facts about communication, that was an excellent episode to watch. So we have the ability to have relationships through language. We know that man sinned by the word of Satan. Satan came and used language to entice and seduce Adam and Eve into sin. Man is saved by the word of God. Again, it's the word. And we know that it's the preaching of the word and only through the preaching of the word that man will be saved. That's our doctrine of sola scriptura and why we fight so tenaciously for that doctrine. And it's only through the language and the word that God has given to us that we know what he requires of us and that we know what God has done for us. And these are all crucial. Now, these were picked out specifically as they affect the counseling situation. It is by words or language that we believe one thing or another. I told you this is going to be very basic. Beliefs are affected by repetition of words. Do we believe that? How do we know we believe it? Go ahead, somebody say it. What does the world try to do to us constantly? What is catechism? What is a catechism? What's the purpose of a catechism? It's the repetition of principles and ideas so that we in, you know, are ingrained, we're soaked in them, and we know the truth. So that can be done either for good or for bad. The world tries to catechize us every day, and so that's why we actually repeat and have a catechism. Words or phrases constantly repeated help induce attitudes which become part of the mindset. It's just the way God has created us, all right? And uh, we see that, and classical education in particular has really adopted that methodology this of, of catechism questions, repetition, uh, and even in, um, what, do you, what do you call it? I'm, my, the Latin, what do, what do you call the Latin repetition? When you were teaching the young kids Latin, nobody going to help, huh? Yes, that's what that the word failed me. The word failed me. Yes, we teach the kids Latin by by doing the Latin chants, and they they in their classrooms, and they do that every day. An ungodly mindset may have to be broken broken before counseling can be effective. When you hear something repetitively day in and day out, as we do in this world, uh, the influence of this world is, is constant repetition of ungodly thoughts and, and behaviors. For example, addiction is a disease. If you, if you ask that question 
out in the mainstream, what, what, if you ask the question, is addiction a disease? What do you think the answer is going to be? Yeah, because we're constantly told that addiction is, is a disease. What, is the, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, well, I, I guess that's another slide. The Bible says addiction is what? Sin. So part of the skill or the technique, as we learned last week, that aids a counselor in learning to recognize what people are, are saying. That's part of the skill that we need to understand, get to, to know what do people mean. Repetitious phrases can often reveal unbiblical attitudes. For example, take the phrase, I can't. People, if, if, you, if you tell somebody to do something and they don't want to do it, what do they say? I can't. How often do we say, I can't do something? when it's really what? I don't want to. So the person must see their condition in light of God's power and the gifts he has given to them. One of the problems in, in counseling with people that you, you will encounter is this negative attitude. I just can't. It's too hard. I'm not a, it's not in me to do that. And if you're dealing, remember, the presupposition in biblical counseling is you're dealing with a regenerate person. And if you're dealing with a regenerate person, you got to change that mindset that the world has, has catechized into them, all right, and convince them that from the word of God that they are able to do far more than they think they can. So the counselor must be aware of the misuse of language, all right? So, for example, a person may say, I need to do this, or I need to do that, or I need this instead of, well, I, I really, I want that. And you have to demonstrate and show them you don't need it, it's, it's that you want it. And that's a very popular one. And a person may use metaphors or figure, lang figurative language to avoid the real problem. And that can come in, what, well, what seems to be the problem? Well, my, my husband's just a pain in the neck. You know, and using phrases like that without getting right to the real problem. He's not literally a pain in the neck. Unless he's a vampire. The person may speak, for example, about tension between him and another person. What's the situation? Well, we, there's tension between us. Is that really the problem? The problem is not the tension, but the problem that causes the tension. And if you're dealing like with tension, you're only dealing on a, on a superficial or a, a surface level. And what you want to do is get to the problem. Why is there tension between you? All right. So the proper use of language can often be the decisive factor in helping a person to solve problems biblically. If you can convince somebody, you don't need this, you want it. Or you, you, when, you say, when you say, I can't, you're really saying, I won't. Right, and show them that you, they do have the ability. So the biblical approach to correcting language issues is first to confront the person, no surprise there. That's exactly what we're admonished in scripture to do. Then explain the facts, these are the facts. Because remember, most often when there's interpersonal relationships, whether it's husband and wife, two friends, whatever. Uh, there's a question of misperceptions and then a lack of understanding of what the other person is saying. That's a big part of it. So explain the facts, confront the person, explain the facts, and then set about biblically co correcting, the, correcting the errors. The counselor must be aware of language masking unbiblical thought and attitudes and then correct it, such as using clinical psychological terms to describe something. And that's why if you've ever come to me and, and you said, well, you know, I have a friend who's ADHD. I said, well, I, I don't know what that is, all right? 
Usually most, you know, want to know the problem with most people who claim to have ADHD? They're BAD. <laughs> okay. My point is, not, I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong that, that there was something that need, doesn't need to be addressed. What I'm saying is we have to be careful of buying into psychological terminology. A perfect example of, of how to use language is Jesus to the rich young ruler. Remember, the, everybody here knows the story. There's no novice here. All right. The rich young ruler comes, what must I do? All right. And he calls him good teacher. Remember? And what does Jesus say? He says, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. All right. That little encounter is rife with, with, with biblical example. Jesus showed the ruler at least two crucial facts just with that brief encounter that we read in the scripture. One, when he tells him to go and sell all you have, all right, he shows him that he didn't really keep the law. And he was not good like he thought he was. All right? And two, Jesus was either God because he called him good or he was not good at all. And so he cut, just with that brief encounter, Jesus cuts right to the quick. A good counsel will want to get to the, to the bottom line as quickly as possible. We don't like, we don't like to drag things out. There are some biblical counselors that only counsel somebody four or five times. If you don't got it by then, you don't got it. Whenever it appears that counseling is not going well, it's wise to re-examine the use of language. What is the person really saying? Also, the frequency of words or cliches may be a clue to the hindrance in counseling. If you're struggling with somebody and you're not getting anywhere, make sure that you're talking on the same level. Make sure that they understand what the words mean. And especially if you're dealing with a new Christian, we have our own form of language. We have Christianese. We say a lot of things, you know. You start talking about redemption and atonement and things. The average person on the street doesn't know what you're talking about. So you have to be careful so that they understand exactly what it is that you mean. Now, here's a little chart that I took out of Jay Adams' book uh, to, to help. First column is what is what a typical response from, from a counselee, and the second is how, an example of how the counselor should respond. So, person says, in response to a failure to do something, he says, he says, I did my best. What does the counselor say? Something like this. Remember, the best is what God says to do. Notice, what do you do? You always bring it right back to the scriptures. I could never do that. And here, this is a typical Jay Adams response. It's a little snarky. Never is a long time. Now, that's only one. There's a number of answers to that, to, to rectify that. Don't ask me, all right? but I am asking you. Who else would know? You can see, if you know Jay Adams, you, you can see his fingerprint on this. I can't. God says you can. Do you mean can't or won't? And by the way, the, this left-hand column, these are very, very typical responses that you get in a counseling room. Don't blame me. Are you saying you're not responsible? God says, and you give the answer. I've done everything I could. Everything? What about? Because if somebody says they've done everything, you know that's not, one, it's not conceivable possi conceivably possible, and two, it's, it's an exaggeration. You know how it is. 
No, I don't know. Can you explain it more fully? I've tried that, but it didn't work. Did you really try? I usually tell them try is a four-letter word. You don't try. As, as my good friend Yoda says, we don't try, we do. I'm at the end of my rope. Which end? <laughs> Perhaps you're beginning to uncoil your problem for the first time. I told you this was Jay Adams' chart. I would never be that sarcastic. <laughs> okay. Many people have learned to use crisis language when the issues are only minor, you know. And you see this consistently in, in exaggerated words. And, you know, this is the end of the world, you know. Nothing, nothing is going to, to be the same anymore. This changes everything. Exaggerations usually stem from three sources. Perceptual distortions, a person isn't just looking at it correctly. Self-interest, preserving them own, their own integrity or making that they don't want to look bad. Or just limited experience. Frequent language like, she makes me sick or he's a pain in the neck may indicate the usage has gone beyond the metaphors. You get to a point where you realize that it's serious. Four types of people who tend to exaggerate. The introverted, shut-ins, self-oriented, and those just out of touch with reality. And you can see how each, each one of those groups, yes, It's just a, by experience, it's just that introverted per people have a tendency to exaggerate. I don't know why it is, but that's based on, you know, the, the studies that uh, NANC and CCEF do. Well, we have to realize what an introverted person really is. It's not just somebody who's shy. An introverted person is just focusing in on himself. A lot of people we call introverted, not really introverted. How should a counselor respond to these statements? But I have prayed about it. And this is something that you'll hear a lot if you, especially if you're doing any amount of counseling. But I've prayed about this. Fine, then what are you going to do about it? Or what did you do about it? Prayer, believe this or not, that prayer is one of the biggest excuses that people give to avoid action. That comes from my experience. People will say, but I have prayed about it. And then they use that as an excuse for not taking the action that the Bible says they should take. I have a need to. Is it a need or a desire? I'll never forgive him. If you're a child of God, you will. That's impossible. You mean it's difficult. Do you see the difference? And you see how, as a believer, we always draw things back. We don't allow the ungodly or unbiblical language. You have to always bring them back. And if you, can, if you look at everything that we've looked at so far this evening, you can see that by doing this, you're actually giving the person hope. Instead of, it's impossible. You know, I can't do it. It's impossible. I've tried. I've done my best. No. 
This is what the scripture says. You may have to keep on trying or you may have to keep on doing. And there's, you're always giving, remember, we're always giving hope. Notice the counselor is always bringing the person to biblical reality. Another thing, words like emotional problems are euphemisms and are misleading at best. We hear a lot about emotional problems. When someone complains about emotional difficulties, there's nothing wrong with the emotions. Again, it, it's, it's not to say that they're not feeling what, they, what they're feeling. The feelings are real, but that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the emotions. The emotions are responding to a particular problem. They're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. So to control the emotions, the counselor must get to the underlying problem, which is usually sin. Okay? And when dealing with sin, the Christian counselor never euphemizes using the word alcoholism, which society considers a disease, implies the person is not responsible. What, what you, what's more accurate is the biblical word is drunkenness. What we try to do is alcohol, alcoholism, or I'm an alcoholic, sounds a whole lot better than I'm a drunk. And we try to hurt, you know, save people's feelings when you're not only not saving their feelings, you're saying the same thing, but you're using an unbiblical term. And especially since the connotation that's applied to alcoholism is that it's a disease. That's why people will have no problem calling themselves an alcoholic. Likewise, kleptomania. It's an irresponsible term for somebody who's a habitual thief. They call themselves a kleptomaniac which means that I'm not responsible. I, don't, I can't stop myself from doing it, which obviously, according to the scripture, is wrong. When a person is following a biblical a, a pattern of life other than prescribed by God, he's behaving wrongly and he's sinning. And we have to call sin, sin, especially in the counseling room or if you're helping a friend. Don't try to mitigate the terms. Because by doing so, you're going to give the person the wrong, wrong impression. In each of these circumstances we've talked about, there's nothing wrong with the emotions of these people. If they feel bad, if they feel trapped and whatnot, those feelings are real. There's nothing wrong with those because they're an indication that there is a deeper problem. The conscience may trigger all sorts of pleasant or unpleasant emotions. In that case, the conscience is doing its job. The problem we come up with is if, you, if the person has seared their conscience and there is no emotion, that's, where, that's a, a more serious problem, according to Romans 1. The conscience has the ability to make judgments about one's own behavior. The conscience that God has given to us works for, if it's making a, if you sin, then you feel bad. That means your conscience is working. It's doing its job. <clears throat> what a lot of modern psychology does, it's like if we're sitting here in this room and all of a sudden the fire alarm, the fire bell goes off. And I say, don't worry about it, I got it. And I take out my pair of diagonal pliers and I cut the wires to the bell. Bell stops. Is that better? If, the, if you're having emotional, quote, Emotional problems, what people call emotional problems, that's an alarm. Something is wrong. But you've got to find out the, the problem isn't the emotions. The problem is what's causing the emotional, discern, the, uh, the emotional issues. Sinful behavior leads to unpleasant emotional experiences. And we know that. If you're in this room tonight and you're a believer and you've just, I want you to think back to a, to a time when, when you know you did something wrong and you're trying to hide it. How did you feel? 
Doesn't feel good, does it? Uh, a person who is really seeking the Lord can't wait to, to confess it, ask for forgiveness, and have it dealt with. And that's what this is all about. The way to get relief from unpleasant emotional experiences is to repent, seek biblical alternatives, and to change behavior. However, repentance is not merely for the purpose of relief. Remember, motivation is just as important as the actual act. True repentance comes after, after the recognition of sin against God, and then true repentance. There is some very poor teaching in the church today, and especially in seminars, that you need to forgive people for your benefit. Now, it's true that you get a benefit when you forgive somebody who has sinned against you, but you're doing it for their benefit because they're the offender and they need, the, they need the forgiveness. So to forgive somebody for your sake has got the whole thing twisted upside down. Unpleasant visceral responses are largely involuntary and are triggered by behavior, thoughts, and attitudes. I'm going to leave that for a minute because I think that will become clearer as we go through. The solution to these problems lies in rooting out the cause, discovering the sinful pattern, and changing those habits through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. You've got a, your conscience bothering you. You have an emotional issues because of something. Find out what it is. Repent of it. Change that, that sinful habit pattern through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. That's true and lasting change. The next one, if you notice what just flew in here, the language of emotion and, and action. This is a little slightly different, but now we're going to actually talk about the emotions. First, some important definitions, and this is what I've been waiting to get to. Feelings. Where's my microphone? I'll sing that for you if you'd like. No, I won't. <laughs> Feelings. The perception of a bodily state as pleasant or unpleasant. That's just a very broad, succinct definition of what feelings are. Attitude is a combination of presuppositions, beliefs, convictions, and opinions that make up one's habitual stance toward a subject, person, or act. Notice the difference between feelings and attitudes. And behavior, the activities of a whole person that may be judged by the law of God. Understanding the difference between feelings, attitude, and behavior is key to counseling and, and even in your own self of, of making sure that you're not carrying around any, any issues that are going to manifest itself in emotional issues. Two categories of feelings, good and bad. Very simple. We don't have to get any more in-depth than just that. Emotional responses of the body are responses to judgments made about the environment and oneself. You, the, the situations that you find yourself in will affect your emotions based upon what those circumstances are, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant. The era of the Rogerian approach to feeling is that he reduces thoughts, opinions, beliefs, convictions, and attitudes to feelings. And as we can see, they are different. It's not the same thing. So when a person complains in the Rogerian system, when a person complains, I feel inferior, he's really saying, I am inferior. Okay. Now, and I am inferior is a self-judgment about one's own character. Right? Now, whether, is it an accurate one or not? Maybe the person is inferior in, in the circumstances that he's in. But whether he is or not, that's, that's a self-judgment. 
and that can affect his feelings. Now here's the, where this affects the Christian counselor, especially on the, the issue of the assurance of salvation. One of the things that we hear frequently in counseling, I don't feel saved. As Jay Adams says, it's not proper to say. That's not something that you should be saying. Here's why. Conviction that one is saved is not an emotion. Assurance is not a feeling. Okay. You follow that? Let me keep going. One may feel afraid, sad, or angry over doubts about salvation, but one does not feel saved or unsaved. How, do you, how does one feel saved? It's not, it's not an emotion. If you say that you don't feel it, then you're relegating your salvation to an emotion. And that's not the place you want to be. Because salvation is not an emotional state. Salvation is a relationship to God which affects the emotions, but it is not in itself a feeling. When a person is saved, they have overwhelming feelings of joy and happiness, but that's based upon the knowledge they have of that they have been delivered from Satan's sin and death and translated into the kingdom of God. Those objective facts lead to an emotional response, especially if the emotions are working right. Does that make sense to you? But to say, I, f I don't feel saved. What does feeling saved feel like? It's important to distinguish between the emotion and the conviction of judgment that triggers it in order to find a solution to one's problem. Assurance of salvation is an important issue. Look at how long we've been preaching from the book of 1 John and almost every message comes back in some form affecting assurance of salvation. John's whole letter, five chapters, was written to, to increase the assurance of the early church. So it's a major issue. And part of the problem why it's an issue is because we have an unbiblical view of what assurance really is. And that's what we've been trying to do in the morning's messages. Assurance of salvation depends upon, and there's a few things, and notice how these line up with what we've been preaching on. Assurance of salvation depends upon God's promise in the Bible. Faith in and reliance upon Christ and his finished work. Evidence of salvation in one's life. Remember the three tests from John, John 1. The witness of the Holy Spirit. And those are just four things. But notice, those are things are all objective. They're convictions. They're judgments. They're not feelings or emotions. If you look at that and you can say, yes, I, I believe God's promise in the Bible that, that he saved me. I have faith and I'm relying on Christ for my salvation and on him alone. I have experienced uh, fruits of repentance in my life. I've seen the difference from what I used to be and what I am now. And yes, I know the promise the Holy Spirit has witnessed my own spirit. That will produce, hopefully, an emotion of joy. But it's, it's, it's the joy of the objective fact of your salvation based upon the word of God. Follow that? Okay, just want to make sure you're there. Okay, just a couple more quick slides. I'll move some of, some of these a little more rapidly. The genuine feelings of salvation will only come out of a judgment soundly based upon the scriptural basis of such assurance. In counseling, attitudes may be addressed and changed more directly than feelings. Okay. Attempting to change feelings without changing the underlying causes solves nothing. The person will only lapse back into 
the same state as they were before. It is attitudes that often stand in the way of solving issues. Like I said, I'm going to go through this a little quickly because we're running late. If you have an, a problem, a question, just raise your hand or holler out. Attitudes usually involve habits or thoughts. Changes in attitude require changes in habits, which stem from the biblical putting off, putting on dynamic that Paul teaches in the book of Ephesians. Now, Skinnerians, followers of Skinner, consider any and all activities of the body as behavior, including functions of the nerves and glands. In other words, even feelings and emotions. You can see how that would cause problems and how that would even affect like calling alcoholism a disease. They usually draw the concept, deny the concept of any responsibility whatsoever. Remember, he believed man was just a complex animal. And Skinnerians never deal with the problems of mankind as a result of sin. And the problem of sin will be addressed in a future session. Questions? Yeah. Um, this is more of like a statement. So um, before, uh, and I agree with this completely, that this is, this is true that um, when you ask someone, when they say, well, I've done all that I could, or no, I prayed. It was like, I've already prayed about it. And it's like, well, what have you done about it? Something that I have issues with is I'll do too much action about it, but not pray. So also a good thing to ask someone when they say, I've done all I could, is, well, have you prayed about it? Yes. Yes. And, and in fact, a couple of weeks ago, we, we gave how to make decisions and <clears throat> we broke it down into some steps. And one of those steps is praying. It should always be prayer involved. Prayer, prayer is, the base, is, is the basis for biblical counseling. Because we know that it's not, the, it's not the skill of the counselor. It's not even the willingness of the person. But it's God, the Holy Spirit, who is going to do the results. Excellent, excellent observation. I know a lot of this may sound counterculture because it is. Because our culture has been so psychologized. Even the church has. Okay. Pastor Anthony, would you close in a word of prayer?